Hello. I wanted to let you know about a special opportunity to join me and an amazing group of women for brunch on September 22nd at 1230 in Wayne, Pennsylvania. You'll enjoy fabulous food and great company. I'll be there to talk about my book, The Vital Spark, reclaim your outlaw energies and find your feminine fire, and every guest will get a signed copy. In the process of growing up and adapting to external demands, women often cut themselves off from vivifying qualities such as shrewdness, cunning, and disagreeableness. We think we're not allowed to be such things, but reclaiming and integrating these qualities brings new energy for living. I hope you'll join me on the 22nd if you're in the Philly area. For more information or to register, contact Jill at happywomendinners.com. That's Jill at happywomendinners.com. Thanks. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hi, everybody. We've been paying a little bit of attention to the trending ideas in social media and search engines, and we just kind of stumbled along a particular term, demure, that just seemed to be showing up everywhere. It's connected to a particular influencer here and there, but it caused us to just wonder, why is that concept? seems so attractive in the collective. Why is it that people want to talk about demure? And we thought we would take a Jungian perspective and unpack that as to surmise. Why would that suddenly become valuable? And I think it's an, it's an interesting phenomenon, right, that suddenly something um, gets taken up and it's a little bit inexplicable, sort of why or how it happens, why this, why now. And you know, Jung did this with a different trend before social media when people started reporting UFOs. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So people all over the world, I think most many of them in the United States, of course, because we're the nuttiest bunch, but, <laughs> but many people all, all over the world were reporting seeing UFOs. And this would have been like, like sort of after World War II, the Cold War in the 1950s, I think when he wrote that article. And, and he, he writes this brilliant essay, which we've talked about in a, in a prior episode about UFOs and, and sort of like hit, hit, the way he understood it is an archetype has been constellated. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that uh, you know, there's something moving in the culture that's informed by the collective unconscious that's giving expression to something that needs to be brought forward. And usually uh, that thing compensates something that's missing in the collective. So we wanted to sort of do that same thing tonight with, uh, with this interest in demure. So. so just for people that might not be familiar with the term, because it is kind of old-fashioned, in general, if somebody is thought to be demure, they seem calm, they seem settled, perhaps mature or uh, fully grown. That the, the word demure comes from a Latin that simply means something that is ripe, full, uh, grounded. It's come to mean something about good manners, um, being reserved, and perhaps when it's excessive, it can mean coy. But it's an ancient term, which means that it's a quality that human beings have noticed in each other, either being present or being absent. And there are certain cultures and time periods where 
being demure was an expectation, and that particularly women would often be encouraged to be more subtle, more good-mannered, more receding in a way. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about the phenomenon of it getting kind of picked up, and, and for those of you who maybe aren't so aware, it's very popular now on TikTok, and there's even brands that are picking it up and making it part of their marketing. Um, so, uh, it, you know, one of the questions is, is it sort of ironic, you know, are people saying, you know, being demure is good, or is it, is it sort of tongue in cheek and sarcastic? I don't even know that anyone really knows. It's just the nature of this, that it's touched something off. But of course, part of the problem with the concept of demure is that I think it's really only ever applied to women. Mm -hmm. And and so there is this sense of a kind of regressive expectation of feminine, uh, you know, being sort of retiring and pure and, uh, um, you know, self possessed and uh, not not showy, uh, um, self effacing, even perhaps. So that's uh, sort of a, a I'm going to say kind of like a problematic aspect of it that it. It seems to imply, um, if, if, you're, if you're lifting it up, it seems to imply that you have a certain standard of behavior for women. Although I will say that as um, a lover of um, Victorian literature and also uh, Jane Austen, yeah. this is a quality that is very common. This is, this is a value of Victorian society, right? But it is a value for men as well as women. It's just that it might be a different word used for men. So, for example, I mean, I, I said Victorian, but now I'm thinking of Austin. Like, you know, I, I just finished rereading um, Emma, which was just so fun. And, and, in, and in Emma, there are these two men, right? There's um, Frank Churchill and then there's Mr. Knightley. And Frank Churchill is not particularly demure. He's a little showy. He's not necessarily, uh, he's, he's very charming, but he, um, he steps out of line a few times and he, um, he's very flirtatious with Emma in a way that's kind of off-putting. And ultimately, although Emma enjoys it in the beginning later, she's like, wow, he's kind of a, he's kind of a jerk, you know? And it's Mr. Knightley who is, I think, what we could call the masculine version of Demure. Not that he's retiring and self-effacing. He's definitely not. But he is very um, modest. He doesn't put himself forward a lot. He's not attention-seeking. So, so I'm not saying that the value is completely absent for men, but there, is, there are some shades of demure as a word that carry with it uh, sort of, I would say, a regressive expectation for women. And what I would suggest is, We've kind of blended two worlds as we do. Is that <laughs> sorry if I you know, took us off? It's okay. Well, we started with the idea of when something just pops up in the culture yeah, where no one's yes. really been talking about it, it's somehow right. been under the ground. And then we look and provide a historic perspective that when demure was a very conscious yes. concept and that people were monitored for the behavior, yes. anytime that happens, then it becomes a problem because it becomes a restraint. Yeah. What if I'm not yes. demure? Yeah. Or what if I'm, right. you know, born in a family where I'm, I'm expected to be on stage all the time and I wish mm -hmm. I was demure. Mm -hmm. But as yeah, soon yeah. as the society begins to set anything up as a standard, it's going, at sooner or later, it's going to become a cage to certain people for sure. Well, and, but it's interesting uh, yeah. though, and I think like worth maybe a different podcast is like, does it make sense for society to have standards? Because like, yes, it's going to become a cage and we probably need to have some standards, which in a way, I mean, I think that's a whole separate uh, conversation, but in a way it, it does relate, I think, to why I'm thinking this, this concept has um, touched something in the collective at this time, because the ethos of our moment is that being very expressive, putting yourself out there in a very loud and showy way, 
has been rewarded on social media. I mean, as a, and you know, older person, sort of a Gen X, I, I am sort of shocked at how many younger people um, just share really personal parts of their lives online all the time for everyone to see. And it's clearly that window has shifted around what we consider personal, right? And people are, are putting things that I think of as very private online in a kind of casual way. And in some sense, the louder and more demonstrative and more attention seeking you are, the more you are rewarded. And, and it could be that this is a compensation for that saying, hmm, maybe it's time to be a little more self-contained. Yes. I think that certainly when we look at extremes, so if we think of it, what's the opposite? of demure, flamboyant, exhibitionistic, mm -hmm. ostentatious, uh, garrulous, um, histrionic, rash, histrionic, attention-seeking, yeah, extravagant, and and um, in terms of capturing attention, either just within your social group, but certainly fighting to capture the attention of the collective. That is, that's a technique. I mean, mm -hmm. to, be, to be really uh, overdone in one way or another gets people's attention, which goes to what you were saying about histrionic uh, traits. Is it often the histrionic personality style is fighting to be noticed because their feeling states or their needs were not attended to, mm -hmm. and so they developed a trait of exaggerating their style of communication as a way of being known. Because you know whoever's taking care of them is not is not really understanding or even seeing what they need. But but here we we were talking about a a collective process, right? So, absolutely. That, um, that, that there's a kind of cultural value uh, that's been in play uh, that has kind of promoted a certain sort of. Um, brashness, let's say. Yeah. So I, I think back to the podcast we did on the dark side of Aphrodite, mm -hmm. that there's an enormous pressure, uh, pressure to be an Aphrodite and to put everything out there and that being seductive and extravagant and flamboyant, uh, wearing a lot of makeup, being sexy and flashy and showy, that that's where all the good stuff is. Mm -hmm. and, and that that can be an enormous pressure and a very unfair pressure uh, on young women, they, 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 mm. they'll despair at the pressure of having to look like Venus. Right. So something else comes forward and says, hey, wait a minute, what, ab what about the compensatory side where you're not worried yeah. about what your hair looks like, where you're not worried about whether or not you're going to stop traffic with the outfit that you're wearing? Maybe if we, if we found a, an attitude that would allow us at least sometimes to cast all of that off mm -hmm. and to be quieter, more subtle, and, and perhaps even subtly elegant even. Mm -hmm. What's that like? Is there any benefit to that? And I think, just as we were saying, a curiosity about that seems to have taken hold. If for no other reason, it's given people a term, even just a language, for what the opposite of the pressure to have to, as you were saying, be so flamboyant all the time. You know, I want to pick up on that because you just you just made something connect and it's a little provocative, but mm -hmm. I'm going to just throw it out there. So, you know, this idea about the male gaze, I mean, I think it's a real thing, right? And it's, it's just sort of um, the, the way it is. You know, men are very visually cued when it comes to uh, sexual response, more so in general than women. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, men are looking at women and, and having a response to a way a woman looks. And as a woman, you can respond in all kinds of ways to that. You can invite it and, and, and sort of glory in it. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's like, well, they're all looking at me. So let me enjoy that power. Let me, you know, put on that traffic stopping outfit or, and, and, and kind of feel the, uh, you know, the, the, the power of that. Um, or you can, uh, 
you know, sort of feel frightened and hide yourself, mm -hmm. um, which is also understandable. Um, but perhaps the idea of demure is sort of a response to that. Mm -hmm. Like I could choose to know that I could choose to know that I'm being gazed at and I could respond to it with a kind of um, uh, agency where I neither reject it, you know, and sort of hide. I'm not wearing like baggy sweat clothes, right. but nor am I um, opening myself up to it. But I'm I'm maybe kind of responding in a way that feels like I have control over it or something like that. I mean, I, like I said, it just occurred to me. I haven't worked it out, but um, it it occurs to me that there might be something there. Well, what came to mind as you were speaking is, if if again, a young woman or a girl has felt an enormous pressure to take on an Aphrodite um, flamboyance. And then she acknowledges, I, I feel uncomfortable. I feel like I have to present myself this way, but I'm getting a lot of attention that I feel ambivalent about. Mm -hmm. The introduction of demure also reminds people that there are other choices. Mm -hmm. Choices of what, how to present oneself, choices of how to respond, choices, choices, all kinds of choices mm -hmm. that we're not trapped and whether mm -hmm. it's avoiding attention, unwanted right. attention, or for any other reason. So I love, and, and there's being Aphrodite or demure, I might say, is Hestia. Being Aphrodite or Hestia are only still two options. Or, there are or many would it be other. Artemis? I was wondering about that because yeah. Artemis is so dynamic and bold, and the demure seemed rather, rather quiet. And so Hestia yeah. may not be the yeah, best. Yeah, no, but has, yeah, I can see that. It's, um, it's a quietness mm -hmm. and a calmness of the hearth fire and the privacy of the yeah. hearth. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. I mean, I, I yeah, mean, I, think, I, think, I think that's interesting because demure, I think, can certainly mean, like you said, coy and kind of flirtatious, which is definitely not Artemis. Right, exactly. But Artemis is like, I don't even care about sexuality. Certainly not with you, you know. She's she's uh, she's a sworn virgin, and there's some there's some indication that she has female lovers. Yeah. But she's definitely not interested in men, and so there's, and and that that could almost be a, a form of demure too. But like you're saying, demure also kind of carries this flavor of it's a little it's a little bit kind of flirtatious, so it can be. Um, in a quiet way, yeah. Yeah, but the idea of pulling back. Mm -hmm. and not being big. I think what you're saying with Artemis and Diana is they're rejecting um, anything about being attractive to the opposite gender, right. that she is just her own person right? doing what she wants. And mm -hmm. when Acteon kind of stumbles into the sacred circle, he's taken down. Yeah. So there's this fierce a privacy that she is entitled to and enforces for sure. Right. And so that story is that Acteon spies her bathing. And when she recognizes that, he's out, I should say, he's out hunting with his dogs. When, when Artemis realizes that he's seen her bathing, she turns him into a stag and his own dogs kill him. So that's a bummer um, for Acteon. Yeah. Um, I wanted to bring up this other idea of enantiodromia which is this idea that uh, Jung talked about a lot, where, and he said it's kind of a law of the psyche, that one thing eventually goes so far in one way that it kind of becomes its opposite. And I, and I wonder if that's, again, another way to think about what, what's happening now with our sudden interest in this term, that we've, we've for so long, you know, it's, it's almost like... Um, in the world of social media, anyway, you almost couldn't be too flamboyant. You know, you're, you know, if you think about those, um, those viral um, uh, things that happen, like where teenagers are eating Tide Pods or whatever. Oh, you yeah. know, it's like yeah, these yeah. sort of extreme things that people do for attention. Outrageous. Outrageous. You know, it's like it, it, it's, there's no limit to it, and but but has that sort of kind of 
almost kind of become its opposite where it's like, now we're going to be very, um, understated. Restrained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it just, it, we, we, I, I can hear because we're such amplifiers, you know, here <laughs> on the podcast, just to kind of, um, relax things into a little tighter circle that the, the phenomena as it's showing up is this value of emphasizing modesty, restraint, understated elegance. And the advocates of this as a, it's not quite a social movement, but of the style. A trend. To be a trend, thank you. <laughs> to be consciously subdued and to avoid overt displays of wealth sexuality, or emotion. So it's a trend. It's not a rule. No one's being pushed into it. And just as you're saying, there's a certain kind of psychic hygiene to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is. When we talk about the collective, we're fantasizing that there is some kind of uh, a gigantic mind <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that we all somehow participate yeah. in. You yeah. called it Adam... Um, the grand man, uh, Adam Cadmon, that there's an archetypal human psyche and that we are like a little parts of the greater psyche. Mm -hmm. So again, we, we needed as a collective to cast off a lot of things that were suffocating. Mm -hmm. And that allows us to be extravagant in our experimentation in all realms, by the way. And so for this to be showing up, particularly in the feminine psyche, and has become now a stylistic trend. Mm -hmm. But this option, again, of understated elegance and modesty, doesn't, it doesn't seem surprising and it doesn't seem injurious either. So there's, a, there's a, something I want to move into that is a little, um, I think it's big, and I want your help with it because I think you can really speak to it. And the idea is containment. And containment as a psychological principle and, and even with its link to alchemy. So I'm, I'm going to sort of plant that seed. But before I kick it back over to you, what I want to say is, um, yeah, so I already told you I love Victorian literature. And, yeah, yeah. you know, um, so Jane Eyre is this book that I've loved since I was young. And, you know, at some point, I don't know, some guy broke up with me and I was like sloppy sad. You know what I mean? And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm talking a long time ago. You know, this I made my so early now you 20s. Would be or elegant and fashionably sad. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the goal. That's the goal, right? <laughs> but I was not fashionably sad then. You yeah. know, I was I was really feeling sorry for myself. And I don't think I I'm not I'm not saying I, you know, sort of did anything terribly cringe, but but I certainly had an impulse to do some very cringy things. Okay. And um and I and I remember being really aware that um of, of like the different sensibility portrayed in Jane Eyre of course which is a novel and it's even has some really fantastical elements so it's not like i wanted to like model my life after Jane Eyre but yeah i was aware that there was something in it that i was very very different you know like like um and and i'm thinking it's kind of related to this i mean you know jane gets left at the altar basically. Mm. And, and she doesn't indulge in self-pity. Maybe that's, maybe that's where I'm going. And, and I, yeah. maybe that's related to demure or not, but it seems to me like there, there's something about that. What made me think about this is what you said a minute ago about sort of psychic hygiene. Mm -hmm. She gets dumped at the altar. She, you know, sort of sits around and is numb for a little bit. And then she, you know, packs up her shit and gets out of there. She does. Yeah. Well, so it's a little bit more than that, but she does the right thing, right? She doesn't, she doesn't wring her hands. She doesn't feel sorry for herself. She just does the next right thing. And that was so far from where I was when I was, however old I was 18 or something and feeling terribly sorry for myself. But, I, but I can remember sort of feeling called to try to do something a little different by holding in mind that response. And I, I think there's something. So, so again, I'm putting that, I'm putting that under the bracket of containment mm -hmm. and like when faced with a hardship, can you, can you, can you practice containment? And, and I don't know if you would agree, Joseph, that that falls under this category of demure, but something that so. came up for me. When we were just briefly talked about the etymology, 
that it has something to do with maturity. Mm-hmm. And we think that children, for instance, little children will throw a tantrum or they'll howl and cry and we, you know, we soothe them and contain them. But we associate unrestrained feeling with being young. Yeah. And when we look at somebody who's facing adversity, of course they have a full range of feeling, but they're not swamped by their feelings and that they're able to maintain a kind of efficacy in the very painful circumstance. Mm-hmm. We associate that with ego strength yep. and a mature attitude. And, and we really do re- admire that when we yes. see that. And that's yeah. what you're saying in the novel is she was in pain, but she also made a plan and executed a plan and did not allow herself to regress and collapse. Mm-hmm. And there mm-hmm. is something admirable about that. Yeah. So, and, and it's this idea of, you know, which I, I think containment is an interesting idea to hold up against demure because I think, you know, the, the definition you gave a minute ago, you know, uh, without excess displays of um, emotion, sexuality, and Wealth. what was the other one? Wealth. You know, their, their containment sort of fits that really well. And Jung, uh, you know, was, was interested in what happens when you psychologically contain something, which is different from repression. So, Joseph, do you, I feel like you could talk about that really well. Would you, would you just sort of talk about the difference between containment and repression and what Jung meant by containment? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is that it's conscious. Mm-hmm. In order to contain something, you have to pick something up and put it in a container and screw the lid on and yeah. carry it around. Yeah. And like you're looking at that glass jar, it's like, oh, it's in there, you know, yeah. but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on the side, that compartmentalization, and I'm going to keep visiting it, but I'm not going to let it overwhelm me because I just have a lot of things I have to take care of and no one's going to take care of them for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jane Eyre had to pack her own bags. I mean, right. no, one's going to, no one's going to show up and whisk her off and take care of the, all of that terrible problem that she found herself in. So rather than being loud and uh, performative you know, with, with uh, her distress, she kind of had a stiff upper lip, which, by the way, is very British. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> and uh, keep calm and carry on, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. which, was, which was also a kind of value. And, and even that, as I just stumbled upon that without thinking, keep calm and carry on, that's quite different than this wild uh, displays of feeling or appearance. Mm-hmm. And again, it's not that everybody should do that. It's that when we go too far in one direction, or there's so much pressure to have to be flamboyant that it's exhausting, yeah. then something else rises up and it presses us to be restrained well, for a while. To your point about it being a choice, it seems to me like the ability to contain is, it's a good ability to have. It's not proscript, proscriptive that this is the way you should meet every hardship. Sometimes it may be the right thing to you know, yell and scream. That might be exactly the right response, but it's good to have a range of responses and being very contained. Now, I want to say a little bit more about containment because, you know, you use this great image of you put it in this jar and you screw the lid on and, it, you know, it, it relates to this idea of alchemy mm-hmm. that you, you, as the alchemist, would put the material in the retort and 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 a, and a lot of the time it was uh, maybe a closed retort, and nothing else can come in, and and then something happens to it in the retort, and it changes. Mm-hmm. I think another idea about so repression, you're just like, well, I don't want to know about that. I don't want to think about that. Don't know. Nope, don't want to talk about that. Or that we, it gets sucked out of your brain like a vacuum. Right. Repression's unconscious, and it's like, right. You kind of forget. Yes. You were even troubled by it. That's yes. something or other a couple of weeks ago. Right. Um, uh, but if you're containing something, you're not denying the pain of it. Right. You're not, you know, you're not, oh, that, no, that didn't really bother me at all. That's, you know, no, it's like, that's really painful. And I'm going to put it in this, in this vase and carry it around with me. Be- with, the, with the trust, I think, that when you do that, and this is the alchemical piece of it, when you put it in the container, you trust that it will transform. Mm -hmm. You don't know what it's going to transform into. You don't have control over that. But you trust that if you do that, something else will happen. And again, 
an important part of that is you're not cutting yourself off from the feeling and the pain. You're not denying that. You're, you're just giving it its own space and sort of, you know, there's something here too, I want to say about, um, the relativization of the ego, really, mm-hmm. because if if you're able to contain a great, great hurt like that, or any big emotion, let's say, there's a sense that um, I'm not in charge of this. That there's something out, there's something else going on, and I can submit to the process. Mm-hmm. Our Patreon has had a makeover. There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. Patrons who support us at the $5 level and up will now access Young Love, weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by supporters. At the $10 level, you can vote on topics for podcast episodes and vote on which guests we invite. And at the $25 level, you'll also be able to watch behind-the-scenes content and even join us for occasional live events. If you'd like to be a part of all this, the link to our Patreon is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. Deepening into that, so, so maybe we do have a, an impulse that would be thought of as the opposite of demure, where we're, we're really mm-hmm. big and, and out there. And for whatever reason, we decide, we decide that we're going to pick something and make it private. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, if we think about Some of us who are intensely extroverted may find that every thought we want to speak or every experience turns into a posting or a film on social media, that there's just not a private moment for us. And sometimes people begin to feel strangely and intensely anxious. And what's happening is that they're putting all of their material or way too much of it out for public commentary. Mm -hmm. And so that can then give us an impulse that, wait a minute, what do I get to hold just for myself? Mm -hmm. And then we discover that some things are really not meant to be shared. Right. And that's a decision. And then we begin to feel more sturdy Mm -hmm. and, and more stable. And we have a sense of privacy inside of ourselves. So it can allow us to kind of constellate. Uh, a sturdy feeling versus being kind of vaporous. Mm -hmm. So that's a skill that we generally need. When we have a little bit more of that, which, by the way, happens later in childhood, because, again, kids, it's all extroverted. It's all out in the middle of the room or in the middle of the supermarket or whatever it's happening. We then get to be wise and think, I'm having this really big reaction, let's say, just hate my boss. Well, I mean, like hate them. Like every time I see them, like I, my face turns shades of red, and and it's a problem. And I acknowledge it as an excess that I don't want to be caught in mm-hmm. for whatever reason. So the first decision, as you were saying, is we put it in the vessel, which is the decision that I am not going to outwardly express this. Mm-hmm even though I am monitoring my inner experience, that alone is quite difficult, but it builds character. Yes. It builds ego strength. The second piece in terms of this being made into an alchemical process is that I am watching my fantasy life around the thing Mm -hmm. that I am suppressing. So if this person, let's say, was journaling or in analysis, Mm -hmm. We would say, okay, you're thinking about your boss, you feel furious. What are you imagining is could happen next? Oh, I walk in and smack him in the head with a, mm-hmm. I don't know, a wet cod. And then what would happen? And he'd cry. And then what would happen? And you begin to notice the intense fantasies that are linked to that strong feeling. And that has to go on for a while. And then if we can keep watching without interfering, which is what you were saying, Lisa, that the fantasy begins to lead to an unexpected place, which is often at the root of what's going on. So, for instance, I hit him with this big wet cod, he falls Mm -hmm. on the ground and cries, and then I say this and he does that, and 
on and on and on. And then suddenly we're both on the floor crying. And then suddenly <laughs> I realize that I'm really mourning a terrible loss of home. And I have this interesting fantasy that if I were to leave my job, then I would be free to relocate hmm. back to a place that feels like home. Hmm. And then that creates this radical shift of feeling. Like, oh my gosh, it isn't about my boss, but the unconscious right. had created a strategy that by causing this alienation of, of my career, that then it would be able to yank me back to this place that it wants me to go. But by deciphering it through containment, I could discover that's something I really want, and then the ego can elegantly, demurely, <laughs> mm -hmm. can make a plan, or decide mm -hmm. at least if it's something that it wants. But it's the containing and watching and yeah. particularly the fantasy material that suddenly will go to a place that we couldn't have guessed that gives us relief. Right, right. Yeah, that's really, really great. And it brings up for me something that, uh, it's been a little while since I um, have worked with this concept, so I'm feeling a little rusty on it, so maybe you can help me. But it, it's the way that like, part of the point of what we're supposed to do in, in analysis is not repress and not act out. Exactly. So, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not that, um, and, and perhaps, perhaps Demure captures this, right? This kind of middle way mm -hmm. that you don't repress it and just not know, but you don't act it out. I'm thinking, you know, like you're saying, you don't just actually go hit your boss. Yeah. You talk about it in therapy, right? Therapy is that, that alchemical vase, you know, where be. things can, right, that where things can be held, right, or it could be, hopefully yeah, yeah. is. And, and then we're in, there's a Jungian analyst named Goodhart who coined this term, the secure symbolizing field. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And, and so that's the place where you're not repressing and you're not mm. acting out, mm. but things can be held, things can be related to, Things can be, we can be curious about them. We can circumambulate them. And that's where things transform. Things don't actually transform if you repress and they don't transform if you act them out, but they do transform if you're in the secure symbolizing field. And that's the field of kind of containment. So what I'm liking it, we're kind of um, bringing an idea forward that the demure Langu language or the valuation of demure could also be a bid from the collective psyche for containment and self-reflection, not just containment. But if, if I just bring things in, which by the way is also a form of introversion, if I bring right. things internally yes. a bit more and I'm considered about my actions, what might I discover? And I do think when I, as I were talking and I've been thinking that often what we call demure is something that might be actually very natural to people that are more introverted. Frankly. I was going to, I was just thinking, I think we're in typology. Yeah. yeah. And so there is a, because Americans are very typologically, we trend mm -hmm. towards extroversion mm -hmm. and we reward extroverts. Mm -hmm. So part of the, the movement towards demure could very well just be, you know, a call to introverts to kind of gather together and cast off some of the pressure you yeah. have to ape extroverted, highly extroverted behavior, mm -hmm. and instead be able to kind of pull back into a style, psychological style that doesn't pressure you to have to put everything outside. Right. That there that there's that there's there can be a lot um that that's held internally. You know that, for example, you have a thought and you just hold it internally. You don't. You don't have to extrovert it. You don't have to announce it out there. Right. And and as you're saying, that that comes quite naturally to introverted people who tend to be somewhat devalued in our society. I can imagine that. And there is this interesting typological phenomena called false extroversion, mm -hmm. where you know 
you were born into a family of extroverts, but typologically, just by your own nature, you're an introvert. So when your parents that are all involved in the community theater, let's say, mm-hmm. see their kid who's really bookish and doesn't want to play and doesn't want to be involved in the things that the parents think of as normative, it's concerning. Oh, Lisa, she's alone, I think, too much of the time. And mm-hmm. so an extroverted parent will then sign Lisa up for the local, I don't know, dance troupe that's going <laughs> to give performances or is going to, you know, force you to do one thing or another to be out in front again, thinking, well, this should be a good thing. Mm-hmm. Because we're children and we want to please, a child who's an introvert can adapt, can learn how to navigate that space, maybe even find it pleasurable. But often later in life, when they realize they're actually an introvert and they give themselves permission to naturally be introverted, it feels like they're finally back in their own skin. Mm -hmm. Right. It's it's almost euphoric Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for people to discover that. So I'm wondering if also being able to talk about the demure characteristics as valuable, as useful, as perhaps even elegant and beautiful, Mm -hmm. people who are introverts may think, oh gosh, that sounds perfect. Mm. And, And it's maybe one day going to be seen as something that's good and not that I'm just being too quiet or that I'm a wallflower. Right, 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 right. You know, this idea of kind of like taking things in and the the way that we as a culture don't value it. And so mm-hmm. maybe there, there are some things going on in the culture that are kind of countercultural in a way, like perhaps, you know, this emphasis on being demure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting because I opened uh, my email this morning and there was, a, there was an article about the return of veiling in the Catholic Church. And it oh. profiled these young women who are attending mass and wearing veils. I mean, you know, these veils are, they have pictures, these kind of beautiful lace veils that, you know, these women wear over their heads. And it, there's a scriptural reason for it, you know, that, that uh, you know, it's somewhere, somewhere in the Bible it says, you know, that, that women should cover their heads or something. But, but, I, but what some of the women said, and it made a lot of sense to me and kind of psychologically, I think it's very, it's sort of in, maybe in the same realm is, when you're when you're wearing a veil, the symbolism of the veil is you, there's a separation between you and the world. Mm-hmm. So some of these women talked about, you know, this is kind of in, these are my words, but sort of inviting in a, a sacred attitude, mm-hmm. and and that thought that you could um, that you could choicefully, mm-hmm. not because you're being mandated by anyone, mm-hmm. but you could choicefully decide to veil yourself from say the secular world out there for some period of time so that you can have this inner experience of, of prayer. Uh, I think it's similar to what we're discussing, the, the value of privileging the, is that the right word? Yeah. The value of, of privileging the inner world and your own communion with the inner world at times for a time yeah well by just by choice as long as you want to but but, um, particularly in modern culture we've we're deprived of meaningful ritual all the time so for people to rediscover this ancient practice of veiling as Mm -hmm. a way of moving away from the outer world and towards the inner and to try it and see gosh it actually does have an effect on consciousness yeah. that I find valuable. It's novel. It's fun because it's novel, like any other techniques. And, and many traditions have a lot of ritualistic elements to enter into sacred space. You remove your shoes before you go into a, a mosque, for instance, or you uh, put a yarmulke on when you go into the synagogue. And any of those ritual actions signal this change of inner locus. Yes. And it's remarkably effective, which is why it's lasted for thousands of years, this idea. 
So when I imagine wearing a veil, I, I'm not Catholic. I don't go to Mass, and I certainly don't wear a veil if I ever do go to Mass. But when I sort of try it on for size, what I, what I think it would feel like is I am alone with myself now. Uh, you know, other, other, I can't really be clearly seen, so there, mm-hmm. it goes back to that kind of external gaze. Mm-hmm. And, and I can just have what my own experience here that's somewhat separate from the outside world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to feel that there's a, a social trend that's making space for that without you seeming strange or being mm-hmm. criticized. Mm-hmm. So anytime, well, the truth is, on one level, we know that we have many, many different options, but the collective can exert such an enormous amount of pressure on us that we feel that we can't exercise them or we only can exercise them privately in our own house. So when the collective opens up and says, how about this, everybody? Mm-hmm. There's a sigh of relief for the people mm-hmm. that find that meaningful, that they can kind of put themselves that out That it's there. an option, right? Yeah. It's, it's given another option. So th- there's another psychological concept that I just want to bring in. I mean, I think mm-hmm. we've been touching on it, but I just want to sort of name it. And that is affect regulation. Mm-hmm. And this mm-hmm. maybe, maybe goes back to kind of what we were talking about with containment. But, you know, affect regulation, uh, you know, as it, as it sounds, it means the ability to deal constructively with strong feelings. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned before, like, this is not something we expect of small children. Small children have tantrums. You know, we're teaching them affect regulation. Um, you know, here's what you do when you get upset. You don't run off and, you know, slam the door. You mm-hmm. know, here's some other things you can do that are more constructive. And it's a very, very, very important thing, affect regulation, because it turns out that difficulty with affect regulation uh, is implicated or, or involved in, let's say, um, you know, borderline personality disorder, um, um, substance abuse disorders, uh, real difficulty with procrastination. Uh, it's kind of a pan-diagnostic phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Almost any difficulty, almost any, let's say, diagnosis that you could come up with has an element of dysregulated affect in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so learning how to regulate affect is, uh, is really important. And by the way, there was just some really uh, frightening research that came out about early use of tablets in kids. It appears that, they, that, it, um, that it retards their ability to learn affect regulation, which makes total sense because when a kid's freaking out and you hand them a tablet, they don't learn how to regulate, right? They just, just get them. pacified. And then apparently, yeah. I, I didn't read the research, so I'm really just reporting on the yeah. headline. But, but that a couple of years later, you know, they're, they're sort of behind where they should be in terms of affect regulation. So, and, and, you know, it's something that, you know, hopefully we learn as, as children and, and adolescents as well, but it, like, it never goes away. <laughs> I mean, you know, those of you who work in offices, do you have anyone in your team who has difficulty with affect regulation? Do you sometimes have trouble with affect regulation? I do, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, but I think, I think, you know, that this idea that we could, that we could be contained, that we could um, choose to avoid um, you know, excessive or overt uh, displays of emotion, going back to your early, earlier definition, it has to do with our ability to regulate affect. Uh, so something to strive towards. Well, again, thinking about the wisdom of the collective psyche, that if there's such a pressure to over-exaggerate feelings right. so that it can be interesting right. to be filmed or photographed yeah. or put out yeah. in some kind of media environment, something inside of us says, well, maybe it's also valuable not to do that. And, right. Maybe and that's another option. It's another option. And what you're saying is there's good proof. It's actually good research to suggest yeah. that learning how to put kind of cotton mittens around our fiery feelings <laughs> and, and just softly calm that down and what would that look like to the outer world? Mm-hmm. It might be in that world of being demure, being quieter, kind of drawing inside, being more subtle about it. Now, I want to talk a little bit, because we started with this idea of social media, that the idea of demure has actually come into the fashion industry, it's come into the makeup industry, and there, there is and has been 
a whole collection of YouTube videos um, sometimes are literally um, unnarrated, highly produced videos of, of a lovely woman in a kitchen making a cup of coffee slowly and then sitting at a window and drinking it. Oh my God. And, and these can go on for 20 minutes. Oh my God. And people will enjoy watching it for the same reason that you're saying, Lisa, is that there's something comforting. Um, and in that same way, often the setting is elegant but understated. The outfits are minimalist but of high quality. Just a little bit of makeup, but she looks very, very natural. And that she's doing an action like making tea or coffee in a way that's unhurried. Mm -hmm. There's no anxiety. There's no crazy music going on. And that these little videos make it seem like it actually might feel good to deport oneself in that way mm. instead of, you know, having music blaring or something on your, checking your phone constantly or the environment has is, is a mess with everything under the sun laying out everywhere oh, you, else. You mean like the way I would make a cup of coffee? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost right. zen-like. Yeah, well, I was going to say, what it reminds me of is, is the Japanese tea ceremony, Cha no Yu, mm -hmm. uh, the way of tea, you know, which I don't know that much about. I'm sure there are listeners who know a ton of, more about it than I do. But, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's a Zen practice. It's a mindfulness practice, uh, the tea ceremony. I believe it's Zen. It's certainly uh, a mindfulness practice. But do you know much about it? Um, I, I don't, but um, I, I, I actually don't know if you've seen the... Um... There's a wonderful new series made of that old novel Shogun. Mm -hmm, yep. And, and it's uh, gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, this kind of uh, um, 1800s Japan and the way that they depict the tremendous um, ritualization of life, including tea and many other things. Mm -hmm. and, and all of that, as you said, makes us be more mindful. Yeah. So, yep. yeah the the um the the tea ceremony is like uh, incredibly elaborate and intricate and like every single aspect of it is regulated mm -hmm. like the the pot and the way you boil the water and the it's just it takes just decades I think to master it and it's you know and the building that you have it in and the way you pour the tea and everything but it it's um it, it's uh yeah it's very it's very meditative. Um, it, you know, that, that <laughs> I wasn't aware of these YouTube videos, but the other thing that came up for me when, when you mentioned that was, um, you know, I was, uh, I've, I've been, uh, visiting some art museums recently and, and looking at a lot of impressionist art. And I realized, I mean, it's not just true of impressionists, but maybe particularly true of them. Like a lot of Renoirs, you know, there'll be this painting of this kind of, you know, this young girl reading or, or someone looking out the window, you know, um, and and you realize that what the artist has captured is this very quiet moment when the person is lost in thought mm -hmm. and you can almost hear the quiet when you look at the painting mm -hmm. and it's a real moment of kind of introversion and um again this sort of quality of of, of a certain kind of reverie or or mindfulness yes. maybe those two things are totally different uh, mindfulness and reverie but but some, okay, here's the word, interiority. Yes, That's what exactly. it is. Yeah. And, and that one of the things that happens is we need to often kind of relax the environment around us so that it's a bit easier to kind of go within. And often meditation retreats or an ashram might have a very, very plain space, very quiet space, so that it's easier. We don't have to compete so much as you were saying with the tablet and the television and all of this, maybe one day we'll be so disciplined in our capacity to concentrate that we can block out those other things, and undoubtedly many of us have because this is where we live. But we can curate an environment internally and externally. So again, coming back in the fashion industry, the demure clothing is modest, emphasizing elegance and simplicity over flashy, body-revealing clothes, 
neutral tones, classic cuts, minimalist aesthetics, something that quiets down. And if you think about this um, in movies, if you want to portray, you know, the woman that's walking out of the mansion, she's going to be dressed in beige and white in clothing that you would guess cost maybe $2,000, that outfit. And then the woman who is not from that world is going to show up, you know, wearing, you know, skin tight jeans, high heels, you know, a, a blue spangled tube top, big, big makeup and jewelry. And then we put them next to each other iconically. I am not criticizing anyone, by the way. The reason we recognize these things in films is that we have a certain kind of stereotype of something that is calm and something that is more agitating. Mm -hmm. Or or sort of like attention-seeking. It needs to draw attention to itself. Yeah. So this trend of shh. Yeah. (laughs) We'll call it the shh. Yeah. And we talked about lifestyle, slow living, minimalism, mindfulness. And there there are makeup lines that are based on demure. I think some of them are called even demure, which is not having bold trends, but actually emphasizing one's features, neutral palettes, soft uh, contours, good skin care. A lot of these things are not terribly provocative, by the way. I mean, no one's surprised. No one thinks, oh, that's outrageous. Yeah. But it's, it's yeah. what's interesting. But it's almost outrageous is, to not be outrageous. Yes. What's interesting is that it's rising in the collective with a lot of energy. It, nothing about this is actually new, which is what we're just saying. Demure is an old, old idea, but it's coming forward with dynamism right now because its opposite is very, very dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of compensatory. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I, you know, when, when I landed on that word a minute ago, interiority, I just want to sort of circle back because I think that that's maybe an important element of what I've been trying to wrap my hands around as we've been talking about it, you know, from, from wearing the veil and kind of having this inner experience to, um, to feeling like you can disconnect from the world and its expectations and just be with yourself. Mm-hmm. And and maybe a, a kind of um, demure presentation signals that I'm not I'm not really I'm not really interested in catching your eye right now. Actually, um, I just want to be with myself. So uh, maybe that's one way to understand it. Yeah, you know, that demure is a decision, like mm-hmm. anything else, mm-hmm. can be empowering because mm-hmm. you decided to do it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we will see. We'll see what the collective psyche does with this. And uh, I think so. And like I said, there's nothing new under the sun. This is right. like a shocking event. Right. And uh, you had said that, um, what would this look like, you know, in a male mm-hmm. character? Yeah. The truth is, these qualities are often associated with many of the masculine cultures being stoic. Yeah, men yes, are, yeah. Men are expected to be unassuming. Men are mm-hmm. not supposed to be dressing flashy often, being reserved. Mm-hmm. Men should be modest. Men should be gentlemanly. That's yeah, probably the yep. coordinate of demure, yep. uh, polite, respectful, bit retiring, yes, discreet. Not, yes, self-possessed. Ref- yeah, refined, composed, courteous, Mature, yeah. subtle. So like all of that <laughs> stuff's not, none of that's radical. No. Um, and if, but if that were to rise up in the collective with a lot of determination, you'd think, oh, that's interesting. Not that it hasn't been there, but someone's put some voltage to it. Right. So Demir is not new. I think, you know, you and I have talked, I don't think we've ever talked about on the podcast, but we've talked about talking about on the podcast, this idea of the cultivation of virtue, which I think Mm -hmm. is kind of relates to, you know, it's like we're talking about cultivating this virtue of being kind of, you know, self-possessed or, or Demir or whatever it is. It would be we should we should have that fuller conversation sometime too because because you can actually make a choice <laughs> you exactly. don't have to just vomit every thought you have out there in the world you can decide does that work maybe that's right maybe you should do that but you can actually make a choice about it right. yeah and just as you said with interiority is you know and this is why we're worried about our teenagers you know somebody's twelve whether a twelve year old right. boy or girl putting all their material out there as Jungian analysts, we can predict, yikes, that's a lot of very private psychological material 
that mm-hmm. now is not contained and people right. are making God knows comments about it. Right. And if they're negative comments, kids can fall into despair. And and you just don't even realize what effect it has on your psyche even to have all that kind of personal material out there. Exactly. You know? We're not desi- so. designed to that. And that's why certain um, dystopian novels like George Orwell's 1984, one of the most horrifying aspects of that novel is you're observed all the time. Right. That right. You discover your television actually is a camera. Mm-hmm. And that there are cameras everywhere in the world. By the right. way, this is happening. Many of these things are happening in China. Yes. And all of this is being absorbed and monitored. So that's happening in China without people's permission. Mm-hmm. Strangely enough, we're creating that by decision in the United States, by inviting cameras everywhere we go. And there's a part of us, as we see in that novel, should be a little horrified by that. That there's a downside to having a lens on us all the time. There certainly is. Yeah. So is this a good time to switch to a dream? Yeah, let's do a dream. So the today's dream comes from a 29-year-old woman who is training to be a therapist, and she named her dream Grim Reaper. And here's the dream. I'm standing in the living room of my parents' home, looking out the bay window onto the street. I see a dark figure approaching, resembling a Grim Reaper. My heart sinks, and I hide out of view below the window, quietly calling out to my mother, who is in her room. Mom, there's someone here for you. The figure knocks three times, and my mother emerges from her room to answer the door. When she opens it, the figure barges in, pushing a red file folder into her stomach assertively. My mother laughs nervously, unsure of what to do. I feel energy rising within me, and I stand up, pushing the reaper out of the doorway and up against the side of the house. My mother stands beside me as I interrogate it. I speak to it forcefully. Who are you? What do you want? The Reaper, who was previously wearing a mask, now morphs into my mother at a younger age, approximately three to four years younger than she is now. Her hair is long and oddly patched with different colors. She says, I am from another timeline. I cut my hair short, and I wanted to see if your mother cut her hair short in this timeline. She is the true timeline. I tell her that she has never cut her hair short and that it's time for her to leave. So for context, she says two years ago, my mother was diagnosed with stage three stomach cancer. She has since gone through treatment and is now in remission. Prior to her diagnosis, she struggled with addiction. Many positive changes have followed her diagnosis. The past two years, I have been in deep conversation with my mother wounds. The main feelings in the dream were alarm, fear, anger, courage, fortitude, and curiosity. And her associations are as follows. She said, parents' home. I have a mixed experience of my parents' home. It was my home throughout my adolescence and during the height of some of my mother's addiction issues. Grim Reaper. Interestingly, I feel fairly neutral toward the image of the Reaper in my conscious life. I find the idea of confronting the Reaper intriguing. The red file folder. The folder reminded me of the folders my mother used to use to put her music sheets, except it was blood red. My mother used to tell me that red was one of my colors. The long patched hair. The patched colored hair reminded me, the, excuse me, the patchy colored hair reminded me of those hair coloring kits from the early 2000s made for kids. There was something childish about it. My younger mother. I found this version of her strange. I associate this version of my mother with naivete, disassociation, recklessness, and aloofness. So, certainly a complex dream. Well, 
we know it has something to do with her parental complex and her mother complex, a way in which the mother is alive in her. And we know that the dream maker is often trying to help us sort something out or find a different angle, a perspective on something that we are trapped in often. So, she's standing in the living room of her parents' home, looking out of the bay window onto the street. So, one way I might interpret it is, she is looking at the outer world through the lens of the parental complex. So that gives us a hint that how she is going to be seeing things is somehow giving her and us information about how her perceptions are affected when she's looking out through the parent's eyes. Now, I think this is a really important topic and has a lot to do with individuation. For instance, if you're raised with a mom, and let's say, you know, there's a divorce, you know, the mom might be very upset. She gives you her perspective about your dad who failed her. And the child will see the father through those lenses, perhaps for a long time. Hopefully, later on in life, she forms an independent relationship with her father and discovers that she sees him quite differently, but didn't even know how tightly she was holding the lens of the mother. This can also happen conversely. The father has a very strong opinion about the mother. The child identifies with it, therefore doesn't see the mother accurately through their own lens. And later in life, when they realize they actually have their own independent opinions about something, they can see through their own eyes and not the parent's eyes, and make a decision. So that's one association I have just with her looking out at the world. And through the lens of the parental complex, a dark figure approaches, and she interprets that as the Grim Reaper, although I have to say there is no evidence in the dream that's true. But we do know that it's a dark figure objectively, because the camera shows a dark figure but from within the parental complex and her mother's recent uh, rush with a serious illness, the unconscious comes to her, dark and unknown, and is a, clearly a projection of death is approaching. Mm -hmm. So, um, Like I said, it's a, it's a complex dream, but, but here's a couple of thoughts. So first of all, um, you know, death is, I mean, let's say that the figure of the Grim Reaper is kind of an archetypal figure. It's an, it's kind of the archetype of death and, and it's a, it's an, an image of that. And, you know, death is, uh, the sort of ultimate symbol for transformation. And if you think about the, the tarot card of death, I mean, what it portends is some kind of fundamental change of state psychologically. Um, so uh, I think that, that this dream is really about this transformation and, and transformation on a couple levels. As, as you were saying, Joseph, I want to tie this into what, to what you were saying. Um, First of all, there is a sense that her mother, her outer mother, her actual outer mother may be in a process of transformation because she, as can happen when we have a, a brush with a serious illness, you know, um, when we have addiction, uh, one of the things that, that we know is that people change once they hit bottom. Well, that means different things to different people. But if you suddenly find yourself with stage three cancer, that may be your bottom. I can't keep doing this. I can't keep um, treating my body like this. And, and it can catalyze a genuine transformation. And it, it seems that the dreamer is reporting that her, that her mother has, you know, there's really been some changes in, in the outer mother. Um, and so we, we might say that, yeah, she's, you know, she's having her, uh, her confrontation with the, the archetype of transformation known as death. 
But the other thing, and this is, I think, where, where you, you were really speaking to, Joseph, is there is also the mother complex. And I, I think that the dream is, is perhaps also signaling or signifying that the inner mother, the way the mother operates in the psyche of the dreamer, is also going through a kind of death and transformation. And that, that may be more in the significance of this kind of other timeline mother, you know, that this sort of um, odd, dissociated, childlike um, version of, of the mother that, that perhaps wreaks havoc in the psyche to some extent. It's time for you to go. You know, you, you need to go. And, and I think that, you know, I'm so struck by the way the dreamer confronts the Grim Reaper and says, who are you? What are you doing here? It's really, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a positive thing that the dream ego is so ready to have this confrontation. And it is the confrontation that allows the, the change to take place where this kind of archetypal figure morphs into this kind of strange figure. And then the, the dream ego is able to kind of dismiss her or send her away. This, this um, kind of unhelpful, maladaptive complex that's living in my psyche of this uh, childlike mother is something that, that doesn't need to be there anymore. Um, I just want to remind myself of the dreamer's age. 29, 27. Yeah. So, so that 29. Yes. So that, you know, that is a time um, when, when sometimes we do come to terms with uh, things and there, there can be a real shift. Mm -hmm. I think from that archetypal standpoint, it makes sense that they would constellate these very powerful changes inside of her, particularly being we were facing this experience with the mother. And often, when we have a parent that we have ambivalent feelings towards, mm -hmm. maybe the parent's been very, very difficult, even abusive, mm -hmm. and then they become helpless, it creates yeah. an enormous decision and tension in the adult children. How involved do I want to be? Yep. What do I have in me towards them? Sometimes a kind of forgiveness wells up in the individual because the parent is finally vulnerable in a way that they hadn't seen before, and there's an opportunity to repair, an opportunity to connect that wasn't there. So death can bring on so many different dynamics. I'd like to to put a slightly more psychodynamic lens okay. on the dream, which is going to make it seem more ordinary in some ways. So she's in the parental complex, and the dark figure approaches, which means there's something unconscious approaches. She reacts to this unknown thing by becoming frightened. My heart sinks. I hide. And then she does something very important, because I think the unconscious wants her to see this, is when you feel frightened of something, you call the mother forward and say, this mm. is for you. Yeah, that's interesting. This isn't for me. Yeah. That's not really clear. It's almost like she tricks the mother into going to the door, because if she really thought it was death coming, why didn't she run to mom and say, we've got to get out of here, mom. Yeah, Let's yeah. go into the panic room. But right. she's like, oh, mom. Death is here. I'll be over in the other room. Someone or other is here for you. Right. It's a very trickstery, complicated thing. Mm -hmm. The figure knocks. The mother comes, opens the door. The unconscious then pushes something into the body of the mother. And you see something very specific. The mother laughs nervously. Mm -hmm and becomes unsure of what to do, which is exactly how the dream ego felt in the beginning of the dream. Yeah. Her heart sank. She hid out of view. She doesn't know what to do. So what I would suggest is whatever that quality is in her, we'll just call it anxiety, but I think it's more specific than that. Mm -hmm. Something occurs where she becomes anxious and hides. She then pushes that, into the mother, this is called projective identification. Mm -hmm. She pushes it into the mother, and then suddenly she has access to being aggressive. Mm -hmm. The mother is going to be the unsure one, 
And now I'm going, I have access to being a hero and being aggressive and interrogating and yeah. being That's forceful. Really and who are you and what do you yeah. want? So there's, there's important information if this person were in analysis about, one, the relationship with the mother. It is normal for a child to project overwhelming feelings into a parent and to pressure them to evidence that. Mm -hmm. That's part of the mother metabolizing feelings that the child can't metabolize. Right. But for some reason at this point, perhaps because the mother is vulnerable and the dreamer is an adult, the psyche might be saying, this is a thing that happens inside of you. Do you, do you still want to do this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe there are things that you are projecting and pushing into your mother now that make her seem a certain way that might not actually be as fully accurate as you think. Mm. But she stands up, she's aggressive, and lo and behold, she's not aggressive towards death, she's aggressive towards her mother. Mm. So she yeah. comes from someone who's small and hiding and anxious to someone who's looking in front of the mother and jacking her up against a wall and, you know, interrogating the yeah. mother. Yeah, yeah. You know, who are you? What do you want? What's yeah. going on around here? Which is, which is interesting. And then she's revealed. She's, she was unconscious. She was in the dark veil. And suddenly the inner figure is visible through the, the intense engagement that the ego can now have. And she starts to have a dialogue with the part of her unconscious she didn't know. And, and the mother figure seems mostly curious. She's like, I, just, I showed up because I was just curious about short right. hair and timelines and, <laughs> and fashion, you know, right. like, just checking things out, thought I'd show up, take a look. Hardly death. Gently just kind of curious, and I have to say even a little superficial. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you yep, know. Definitely. So, it may very well be that, again, because of all the projection, when that's revealed, the mother might actually be a lot more benign and unthreatening than we might have felt in childhood. And maybe because, again, the mother of the childhood, as she's saying, had a lot of trouble. She was a, an addict. Lots of scary stuff happened. But now the unconscious is saying, now you have a mother with a cancer diagnosis, who's worried about her hair. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what you've got. Not a monster. And your rage, you need your rage, you need to be strong. But she's not the enemy. Right. Of your childhood. That's, that's, and yes, everything you said, that in, this is all intensified because this is the life and death reality is going on, and big stuff causes us to dig deep. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting take. Yeah. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.